Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Before the Law Sits the Gatekeeper, German Jewish Book Culture Through the Medieval and Early Modern Period. Support for these workshops is made possible thanks to the Dr. Michael D. Paul Rare Books Initiative and the Azraeli Foundation, as well as generous support of patrons like you. My name is Ellen Belshaw, and alongside my colleague, Izel Carter, we make up the Outreach Coordination Team for the Jewish Public Library's Archives and Special Collections. The first speaker today will be Eddie Paul, who is the Senior Director of Library and Learning Services here at the JPL, where he oversees collections development, cataloging, and reference services. Over the last decade, he has also developed education outreach programming that includes this initiative, the Where Do You Think You Come From Genealogy Workshop for Youth, and a series of other projects designed to create convergences between our archives and special collections and the public through storytelling. He has worked in various capacities at a range of university and public libraries in Montreal, Toronto, and has curated several exhibitions of rare books. We are excited to be joined today by Renata Evers, who has been serving as the Bruno and Suzanne Scheidt Director of Collections at the Leo Beck Institute since 2016, coordinating the work of LBI's three collection departments, Archives, Art, and Library. She holds an MLS and MIS from German universities, an MCIS from Rutgers University, and an MA in Jewish Studies from Columbia University. She has worked in various capacities in special collections, archives, and university libraries, building and preserving physical and digital collections. Her research focuses on German Jewish topics in the early modern period. Before I turn it over to our speakers, I would like to share the Jewish Public Library's land acknowledgement. The Jewish Public Library is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganyangahaga people. This land is also a meeting place for many indigenous nations. This land has been the site of exchange, creativity, and storytelling for thousands of years. We are grateful to be able to cultivate lifelong learning, imagination, dialogue, and creativity here. I'll pass it over to Eddie. Thanks, Ellen. Before the Law Sits the Gatekeeper. As some of you may know, this is the title of the famous parable by Franz Kafka, in which a man tries to gain access to the law and is stopped by a gatekeeper who bars his entrance. This lasts for the duration of the man's lifetime until at the very end of the point of his death, he is told by the gatekeeper, you are insatiable. At the point of death, the man asks, how is it that in all these years, nobody but myself has demanded entry? The gatekeeper responds, this entrance was designed only for you, and now I'm going to shut it. Whenever we try to come up with workshop titles, we aim for a thematic connection between the texts that we and our collaborators selected. In some cases, it's straightforward, but in others, I somehow feel compelled to get a bit more oblique, possibly a, a bit self-indulgent. In the spring, we had a workshop with the author Alberto Manguel to launch his new biography on Maimonides. And at some point during the session, I had asked him a general question about how authors work through literary influence. And he remarked on Jorge Luis Borges' famous quotation, every writer creates his own precursors. To my mind, Kafka, who wrestled with German, Czech, Jewish identities, whose work crossed through the existing and looming anti-Semitism of Europe, who struggles with authority, power, and identity circumscribed his literary work, these all evoke the ground for many of the works covered in this next hour. Renata will be showing you some beautiful texts on the Reuchland debate, the Pfefferkorn affair, and the Nuremberg identity oath, 16th century examples in which anti-Semitism, conversion, and identity are all bold-faced. And I think it was about almost a year ago that Renata treated my colleagues and me to a preview of some of these remarkable works. And I have to confess now that the texts that I'll be sharing for the next 20 minutes or so pale by comparison in terms of their material significance. And it will be my task to compensate by teasing out some of the narratives associated with them that I have found especially compelling. Now, almost 250 years of scholarship and biography on Moses Mendelssohn uh, are, are behind us and I have decided to start with an anecdote. In the year 1743, just after Rosh Hashanah, Moses Mendelssohn walked the 110 kilometers from the town of Dessau to Berlin. 
and after a few days reached the Rosenthaler Gate, which was the only gate through which Jews were allowed to enter the city. Most were given a bowl of soup, a place to sleep, and then sent on their way. And it was recorded on that date that six oxen, seven pigs, and one Jew entered the city. Now, needless to say, Moses Mendelssohn was a prodigy. He was given a thorough grounding in Torah, Talmud, and the commentaries. And by the time he reached 14, he followed his rabbi, Rabbi David Frankel, to Berlin, where he was also taught mathematics, Latin, English, French, and found employment, as was the case with many scholars, in another field. And he started off as a bookkeeper and partner to a silk merchant, uh, which still afforded him time to study. He, through you know, his 20s and 30s, was eventually introduced to the giants of German literary production, like Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, whose famous play Nathan the Wise was partially based on their friendship. On March 17th, 1808, Napoleon rolled back a number of reforms uh, in a declaration called the Infamous Decree, declaring that all debts with Jews were to be annulled, reduced, or postponed. The infamous decree imposed a 10-year ban on any kind of Jewish money lending activity. Similarly, Jews who were in subservient positions, such as Jewish servant, uh, servitude military, uh, in the military, were unable to engage in any kind of money lending activity without the explicit consent of their superiors. Napoleon's goal in implementing this decree was to integrate Jewish culture and customs into those of France. Within a few generations, overnight, Jews could become French or German after centuries of being ghettoized and legally segregated. Now, this struggle lasted until the 1780s with the passing of the Law on Jewish Equality in the North German Confederation in 1869, and its extension with the ratification of the Constitution to the whole of the German Empire in 1871. Emancipation in Germany also came first to those reg regions that had been conquered by the French. Now, in tandem with em emancipation, there was something called the Age of Enlightenment, which included a range of ideas centered on the value of human happiness, the pursuit of knowledge, uh, obtained by means of reason and the evidence of the senses and ideals such as natural law, liberty, progress, toleration, fraternity, constitutional government and the separation of church and state. Now this all sounds pretty good, but when the light shines brightly into the dark exile of the Jewish psyche, it becomes an invitation to venture outside and beyond the ghetto gates. And by this, I mean the psychic gates. Now obviously centuries of intellectual cross fertilization had already passed by the 19th century, but this decree and this stream of, of uh, Jewish enlightenment was something altogether different. Many scholars use the example of the great German poet Heinrich Heine, um, the great German Jewish poet who exemplified an ambiguity and ambivalence that gave rise to something called hyphenated identity. Heine was faced with a dilemma. His family, like many good Jewish families, wanted financial security for him and they sent him to law school. But in order to go ahead with this, he needed to convert. What he really wanted to be was a writer. But his family told him, you know, this writing thing may not last. And they told him, convert, finish your law degree. We know what's in your heart. He resisted for a long time, but finally converted and ended up regretting this for the rest of his life. Now, we're going to skip away a few centuries back um, to Martin Luther. Now, a number of years ago, not having known anything beyond the most superficial elements of the life of Martin Luther, I was listening to a podcast and one of the scholars being interviewed was asked about the broad appeal Luther's Bible had on the German public. Now, this is probably common knowledge to many of you who are far more versed in cultural history than I am. But in the 16th century, Germany, which was variously comprised of a number of principalities, duchies, grand duchies, kingdoms, free Hanseatic cities, and imperial territory had almost as many German dialects. You travel to one duchy from another duchy and try to communicate in your local dialect, and you may be marginally understood, but you'll be received and treated like a stranger and very possibly with some suspicion. This is still uh, the case in 
many countries in Europe, particularly in Italy, so I'm told. But in his youth, and what makes this interesting is that young Martin Luther traveled across Germany and with an ear for local dialects, his translation of the Bible used a German that according to the scholar I heard on this podcast was universally accessible to the, to the citizens of all the principalities, all the duchies, all the grand duchies, all the kingdoms, all the free Hanseatic cities. Now, here's a slightly uncomfortable but apt comparison. What does the Rambam say in the Mishnah Torah? The Torah speaks in the language of humanity. Now, this is perhaps why one reason the full first full translation of the Bible in German in 1534 was such a success. Of course, it was helped along just a bit 17 years earlier on Halloween in 1517, when Luther nailed his 95 theses, the disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences on the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg. But this changed the face of Western civilization for the next several centuries. Mendelssohn, however, did no such thing through his translation of the Tanakh into German. But it did elicit a lot of opposition from people like Franz Rosenzweig and other rabbis who were part of the, the orthodoxy. His title for this translation of uh, the Tanakh into German was The Paths to Peace, the Netivot HaShalom. And this was based on the biblical text in Proverbs 317, also recounted in the Torah service. It's mainly known to this day by its more prosaic name, the Biur, or in Hebrew, the explanation. Uh, because as was the case with most German scholars, Jewish scholars, Mendelssohn included explanatory Hebrew commentary that appear on each page. And in keeping with his aesthetic agenda, Mendelssohn highlighted poetic passages of the Pentateuch. To counterbalance these and other innovations, Mendelssohn in his long introduction uh, constructed a religious genealogy for his project invoking Moses, uh, the prophet Ezra, the Aramaic translations, the Targumim, the, all the medieval commentators, Sajid Gaon, the Masoretes, Maimonides, and many others. By implication, the modern translator joined these and sought upon, put up, took, took it upon himself, the sacred task of transmitting, explaining, and safeguarding the Torah. Now, on the bottom half of the page of the Biur, um, most of these commentaries were not composed by Mendelssohn himself. He included the Tikkun Sofrim, the scribal corrections, but for the first time, commentary was designed to explain the decisions of the translator, in particular where um, Mendelssohn stressed the Peshat, the simple meaning, would diverge from the traditional interpretation. The inclusion of this commentary, as we shall uh, see, testifies to Mendelssohn's use of translation to explain the ways of language of both German and Hebrew, the due paths to Torah for modern Jews. The language Mendelssohn wrote in was a style and a language called Yiddische Deutsch, Judeo-German, in which German was transcribed into Hebrew letters. Now, this was a common strategy of the Enlighteners, the Masculine, because they felt that writing for Yiddish-speaking Jews in this transitional period, that this just wouldn't work in Yiddish. Mendelssohn's motivation in translating the Bible into German was to provide an accessible version for his children to study. Uh, but it was ultimately published for the entire Jewish community in an effort to make the Bible more accessible. As it turned out, he hoped that the translation would replace the existing Yiddish translations, um, which had been done by Blitz and Wissenhausen uh, about 100 years earlier, and some of the Christian translations of the Torah that he felt were not suitable for Jews. Uh, above all, he wanted his translation to be clear, correct, and beautiful. And his first priority as a translator was to disambiguate scripture. He inserted conjunctions and trans transitional phrases wherever possible. He put in parentheses, he took a lot of liberties. But as it turns out, the German was too difficult for the average German. And within the Jewish religious community, and while there was very little opposition to the commentaries in the Pur, it was the translation that really caused the most difficulty. What I wanted to focus on 
in our particular uh, edition of the um, of the DER, and, and I should point out, we have about six or seven of them in our rare book collection. Um, what you find in almost every language is a, a series of words that are pretty much untranslatable into English. Often these words describe sensations that are very familiar to us, but we just don't have the words for them. German is particularly remarkable in this area, and you can find web pages devoted to these words. One of my favorite is the German word Kummerspeck, which literally means grief bacon. Uh, this word describes the time of your life where you're just eating away your pain, sort of like dipping into a, a, a sort of a bucket of Hagen das ice cream. Um, and there are just so many great German examples of this. Um, and with this in mind, and I know this is a, a bit of a, it's a bit of a strange parallel, but Franz Rosenweig, who was the famous philosopher and historian, acknowledged that Mendelssohn was the very first Bible translator to pose the question concerning the translation of God's and untranslatable ineffable name, his holy name that appears in Exodus 3.14, often called the Tetragrammaton. It is, as you probably know, only pronounced once a year in the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, in the Holy Temple on Yom Kippur by the high priest. Now, I won't pronounce the words, these untranslatable words, because I'm not a Kohen and I'm I think we're a bit short of a couple of thousand years from the temple's destruction, and certainly a month and a half past Yom Kippur, but the holy name, which in early versions of the Greek translation of the Bible, the Septuagint, was left in its original Hebrew. It was thought to be um, something that you just couldn't do anything with. You couldn't render it in any way that would make sense. Now, these words in a rendering would be it would become an entirely different workshop, but in the context of this book, the problem he was faced with, the problem Mendelssohn was faced with, was how does one tie the rendering of the name to the revelation of the name in history? How do you connect the sense of the God of the past with the God of the future so that the holy name encompasses and reconciles the God of history with the God of providence? Moses Mendelssohn's rendering, I am the being, Vesen, in German, which is eternal. Tell the Israelites, the eternal being who calls himself, I am eternal, sent me to you. This is Moses Mendelssohn's rendering to German. But there's another question in 314. Moses's question, suppose I come to the sons of Israel and say to them, your father's deity has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What should I say to them? Now, Mendelssohn paraphrased this in German, I am that I will be, to I am the being that is eternal. Ich bin das Wissen, des ewig ist. And you should, please uh, pardon my German here. Now, this changes the diction, the style, and the meaning into something pretty straightforward. But three Hebrew words become eight German words. The answer to the second German word, the second question rather, which is what I should say to the Israelite, Israelites is translated into nine German words. Das ewig wissen wessen, veg sich nimmt, ich bin ewig, the eternal being, that which names itself, I am eternal. Now we can show this uh, on our actual book um, on both pages. Mendelssohn justifies this by using a segment from the Midrash Rabbah to Exodus, which in effect describes the holy name in terms of the way in which past and future are all present in the creator. While at the same time, the name transcends, transcends change or dependency. Um, he felt that this was the word evige, evige, which best describes omnitemporality, the necessity of existence and providence. Now, by the end of the 19th century, there were 17 editions of the Be'ur, um, which just is an, an attestation to just how popular um, this book was. Uh, translations of the Hebrew texts um, generally were collective undertakings by the Basquilin, um, but they were also the most propellant, they were the most active repellents of the revival of Hebrew culture, not just in Germany, but in Eastern Europe. There was a sharp reaction amongst the orthodoxy in Germany, although it was never banned by the rabbis, but their problem wasn't the translation per se, but the commentaries attached to it. In his commentaries, Mendelssohn, as I mentioned, focused on the simple literal meaning, the Peshat, 
Um, but it's remarkable, at least to me, that a language that gave us words like Kummerspeck had innovators like Mendelssohn, who I had no doubt agonized over the translation of certain Hebrew words, such as the one for the words used in Exodus 314. And it was this kind of work, this kind of project that led to movements like the Wiesenschaft des Judentums, the science of Judaism, which premised on the critical investigation of Jewish literature and culture and rabbinic literature, and which gave rise to so many innovators like Marx, Freud, and Adorno, and so many others who contributed to the German intellectual canon, the German Jewish intellectual canon. Um, it really is a remarkable book in many ways. Uh, the second book, um, which I'm going to go to go through a bit more quickly, there was an episode in Mendelssohn's life which led to an ultimate nervous breakdown. Now, I mentioned earlier that Jewish emancipation, um, in effect, gave limited rights to Jews throughout several centuries in Europe. And it resulted in the idea of a hyphenated identity. It's one thing to grant limited rights, but in light of the fact that this coincided with something called the Enlightenment, what does this actually mean? Actually mean. Now, the period is characterized by ambivalence, both from within Jewish communities and in the perceptions humanist Christian intellectuals had of these communities, and in particular by um, some of its most famous representatives. Um, the problem in this particular case is if you are somebody like Moses Mendelssohn, whose writings are uh, highly respected by non-Jews, um, you inevitably get pulled into the public arena to profess the errors of your faith and to embrace the other faith or convert. And you begin to wonder, or I begin to wonder, whether emancipation and enlightenment are nothing more than mere market spin. And it was this in mind where I chose as my second book, The Memoirs of Moses Mendelssohn, for one reason, because it's Mendelssohn's account of the Lavater affair, which to all accounts plagued Mendelssohn for a good many years until the end of his life. Now, Johann Kasper Lavater was a Swiss poet, writer, philosopher, physiognomist, and theologian. And in 1769, he sent a copy of Charles Bonnet's Palingenesie Philosophique in German translation to Mendelssohn and requested in the most genteel of ways that he either publicly refute Bonnet's arguments or convert. Now, Bonnet, as I said, was a philosopher. And in this book, he posited a number of strange scientific and philosophical ideas um, containing theories about the body and the soul and concluded that the immortality of man consisted of both and that the preservation of memory rested upon the fact that the present brain consists within it another brain which received enduring impressions from the former self destined to develop in the life to come. But more importantly, he had some ideas about the number, duration, public nature, purpose, magnitude, and strength of testimony on the miracles performed by Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we can put up a link um, on the uh, presentation, but Basically, Lavater's request to Mendelssohn, because he, in his dedication to Mendelssohn, he writes, most honorable sir, I know not how I can better express the great respect that your excellent writings and even more excellent character, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he asked this question so unforgettable and at the same time so important was this to me that I dare to ask you to ask and implore you before the God of truth, who is your creator and father as well as mine, not to read this work th with philosophical impartiality, but rather to refute it publicly, provided that you do not find the essential arguments in support of the facts of Christianity to be correct. And if you do find them correct, I implore you to do what's prud prudent and essentially convert. Now, I don't think, you know, we need to approach this with some historical understanding, but for Lavater, salvation of the world doesn't happen until all the Jews convert. Now, Mendelssohn had bent Lavater on several occasions uh, before, and he was in the presence of other Christian theologians, but Mendelssohn's stature was such that he was on the one hand held up as the exemplification of such erudition by a non-Christian that to Open, an, open him up to a public shaming was no small matter. Um, 
This was certainly not the first case of a Christian admiring Jewish erudition by any stretch of the American imagination. But in referencing the details of their meeting, which included discussions of the divinity of Jesus, Messianism, and other highly sensitive areas of difference, this obviously placed Mendelssohn in a very uncomfortable position. Now, obviously, and I'm going to rush ahead a little bit because I do want to give Renato uh, time. He refused to publicly refute his Judaism. And it was this kind of entrapment, this blatant display of betraying confidences. This was a, a meeting that was not, whose was, um, proceedings were not meant to be shared publicly. This clear exploitation of the demarcation between the public and the private, which we've all seen quite horribly these days as social media takes sway over civil discourse, turning people against one another. This became a situation for Mendelssohn to diffuse without compromising his integrity. Now, in prior conversations with Lavater and his friends, Mendelssohn had demonstrated a cautious respect and admiration for the historical Jesus of Nazareth. He felt a respect for the moral character of Jesus, but qualified this at the point in which he's imputed to himself the quality of sharing in God's nature. Lavater had asked him how he would have differentiate, differentiated between a Socrates, a Plato, and a Jesus. And Mendelssohn replied, Socrates never wanted to be more than a man. Had he proclaimed himself a divine person or a mediator between God and man, let alone as the sole mediator, I would have to deny him all respect. Um, this basically ended the, um, ended the Lavater debate, but as I mentioned, uh, this plagued Mendelssohn for the rest of his life. Um, but it really does bring to bear this whole issue of hyphenated identity, which I think characterizes uh, the inception of Mendelssohn's work into the German Jewish canon. I'm going to stop here and we will pass it over to uh, Renata. Okay, thank you so much. Um... Let me share my screen. Okay. And Okay. Um, I need some feedback if you can see and hear me. I can see and hear you. Looks great. Okay. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay. One moment. Just have to. Okay. Um, thank you, Eddie, for this fabulous presentation. And thank you so much for the nice introduction. And thank you to the entire team of the Jewish Public Library Montreal, Ellen, Eddie, and Isel, for the invitation to join this workshop. With my presentation, I will go back in time and present two Christian Jewish discourses from the early 15th century and another one from the 16th century, as mirrored in their publications. My first topic is um, the 1484 Nuremberg Jewry Oath. Since the medieval era, Jews had to take a special oath in certain court situation in many territories of the Holy Roman Empire. Here you see the legal code of the city of Nuremberg, which was first printed in 1484. And this, ha this just happened to be the oldest book in the Leo Beck Institute New York collection. The last pages contained regulations for administering a jury oath. No? And here yeah, these are the moment. Here are the the uh, last pages, but here we go. Um, this was probably the first jewelry oath ever to be printed. It became the dominant model for oath formulas for several centuries. 14 years after the publication of the jewelry oath, Jews were expelled from the city of Nuremberg. By 1499, the Jew Jewish community had left Nuremberg. The free city of Nuremberg was an important trading and cultural hub. It was ruled by a group of patrician families. It became the center of German Renaissance and humanism, home to Albrecht Dürer, printing presses, this 
um, happen to be one. Uh, and the first paper mill north of the Alps, and this is basically a picture of it. Guilds had been abolished in the 14th century. Settlements of Jews in Nuremberg were recorded as early as 1146. Jews were under the protection of the Holy Roman Emperor. Flourishing phases alternated with phases of traumatic persecutions and expulsions. In the 13th century, the Jewish population constituted, constituted, constituted about 1,500 persons at its peak. At the end of the 14th century, the Nuremberg Jewish community had dropped to a few hundred. So that is a... Um, that is the situation. But since the 1470s, the municipal council of Nuremberg had secretly petitioned the emperor to get rid of its Jews. In 1498, the emperor approved the expulsion of the Jews from Nuremberg because he was in need of funds. It was part of the deal that the expulsion was not linked to the city. The expulsion decree, which we see on the screen, thus states, we, Maximilian, on our own initiative and with sufficient good reasons, we do hereby proclaim to the honorable, loving, and loyal mayors and councillors of the city of Nuremberg that they shall expel all Jews and Jewesses from the said city. The entire Jewish community had to leave by February 1499. Jews were allowed to live in Nuremberg again in the 19th century. Back to 1484. The work that contains the Jewry oath was an important innovative law collection in German. Um, it was the result of a decade-long revision of the legal code for the city of Nuremberg. It attempted to strike a balance between customary canon and Roman law, hence the title um, Die Reformation der Stadt Nuremberg. After some manuscript versions, the work was printed, which was a brand new technology in 1484, and soon copied by many other cities. As many incunabler, this work does not have a title page yet, but starts with a woodcut left a version without coloring, and on the right side, a colored version. The coat of arms and the two saints symbolize two political powers, the free city of Nuremberg and the Holy Roman Emperor, both rooted in Christianity. Right after the title woodcut, there is an excessive table of contents, 50 pages long. See a page on the left, subdivided into chapters and subchapters, right? And on the right side, a page with two brief laws. Well, so this is one law, and this is another. There's no page numbering yet. Initials are hand colored, here in blue and red. The 1484 legal code was clearly meant to be a practical tool in the vernacular German, not in Latin, with a sophisticated system for finding individual laws, which are very succinct and some more eye candy. After the table of content, the quasi colophon can be found, followed by a two-page introduction um, before the actual law starts. Um, now let's look at the jury oath. Um, the jury oath is located at the end of the volume on the last four pages. The only chapter which is not numbered, it is not listed in the detailed table of contents. The Nuremberg Jury Oath was strongly influenced by the 12th century Erfurt Oath. A single square vellum leaf at the Stadtarchiv Erfurt contains a carefully written German Jury Oath text with a seal attached to it. The central function of oath consisted in providing judicial evidence. It was a privilege to be able to perform an oath. Taking an oath could, for example, mean exemption from undergoing a trial by ordeal. A Jury Oath had to fulfill two conditions. First, it needed to be modeled after Jewish law to ensure that the jury oath taker considered the oath legally binding. Secondly, a jury oath had to neutralize the fear of Christians that the oaths of non-Christians were not valid. The assurance of the sincere intention of the oath taker was key. This is the text of the Air Force jury oath in Middle High German and in an English translation. However, I don't. I want to give you a sense of the structure, not the details. The oath formula starts with the reason of the uh, for the oath, the innocence of the accused. Then God is called upon, and after that, horrific threats follow in case of perjury. For example, unnatural death, leprosy. In short, the entire breadth of God's commandments. So. 
a straightforward um, uh, method. At the end um, of the Erfurt oath, um, uh, the composer of this oath formula is revealed. It is it is um, Archbishop Conrad of Mainz for the city of Erfurt. Taking an oath is a speech act, which was usually incorporated into a ceremonial ritual, a role play. It involved a sacred object and was often performed in a public space. Taking an oath had some similarities for inner Christian and inner Jewish oath situation. Both had to swear on an object, on a staff in old tribal, I mean, old tribal Germanic times, which is was called an Eichtaber Zeremonie, then later on the New Testament or a relic, and Jews on the Torah. The striking Erfurt vellum leaf was probably used in all ceremonies itself. The attached seal, so you see that, faces the text upside down. Both parties might have held it facing each other. The jury owes in the Schwabenspiegel, a 13th century Southern German law collection here in a 15th century version, was also influential for the Nuremberg Oath. The structure is similar to the Erfurt Oath. God the Creator is called upon, followed by a long list of threats and curses in the event of perjury. What is different is first a ritual element. The oath taker had to stand on a pigskin. And here we go, here's a pigskin. And second, the object is defined. The oath taker had to place um, his right wrist into, uh, onto a Hebrew Bible. A Jewry oath was by design an often dramatic, public and sacred ritual that called out for divine judgment. The medieval court has also been duped a theater of terror. Medieval rituals were not necessarily absurd or humiliating at the time, but were considered to be a precaution against the possible interference of demonic powers. A word to the humiliating pigskin ritual. Historians today agree that degrading rituals such as the pigskin ceremony did take place, but were not as widespread and common as later generations perceived them to be. Of 77 medieval German towns and villages that had a jury oath in place, only eight used the pigskin ceremony. Both the 12th century Erfurt jury oath and the 13th century Schwabenspiegel oath were important sources for the Nuremberg jury oath. What was different? The Nuremberg oath spelled out several auxiliary oaths or neben either to make sure that the process was valid. You know? So it was all about being legally valid. And then questions were, First, is the Hebrew Bible a valid copy? Second, does the oath taker believe that Christians believe in the true God? Um, third, is the Jewish oath taker aware of that perjury is blasphemy? And fourth, um, will this really speak the truth? After that, the main oath ceremony could finally start. So the Jewry oath taker had to place his right hand up to his wrist into the Hebrew Bible, a ritual which corresponds to the Schwabenspiegel version explicitly on verse Exodus 27, the fourth of the Ten Commandments, you shall not swear falsely by the name of the Lord, your God, for the Lord will not clear one who swears falsely by his name. So far, so good. But how to find that verse if one does not know Hebrew? Um, the city council of Nuremberg came up with a smart solution. In the chapter on the jury oath, the fourth commandment is provided in the form of a Hebrew word by word transcription with German translations. This was translated, uh, this was presented in a com complex textual layout. Only then we finally reach the actual oath formula with the well-known elements. Moment, let me go back. God the creators called upon the four threats of the Air Force oath as, spelled as, as well as some of the threats of the Schwarmspiegel oath. And continued here. How did the Municipal Council of Nuremberg develop the jury oath and especially the Hebrew transcription? Um, okay. A manuscript codex at the Staatsarchiv Nuremberg contains a collection of sources pertaining to Jews in Nuremberg, including a collection of German jury oath formulas and research notes. What is depicted here is considered to be the original draft of the jury oath from 1484. Ratschlagbuch 13 makes later reference to, to the pigskin ceremony from the Schwabenspiegel. It reflects consciously how humiliating and disgusting the ceremony would have been for Jews and hence not valid. And therefore the pigskin ceremony was not used in Nuremberg. Um, here is again the fourth commandment. 
the printed 1484 version and the manuscript version. As a side note, some of the Hebrew transcriptions reveal how Jews in Ashkenaz would have pronounced Hebrew. The manuscript also, um, that is here, uh, the manuscript also recommends recruiting a group of three or four learned Jews and asking one of the other to find Exodus 10, 7 in the Hebrew Bible to read it in Hebrew and to translate it into German, while the Christian administrator memorizes the page and compares the text based on the transcript. Overall, the city of Nuremberg went to great lengths to make sure that the jury oath was valid for both Jews and Christians. However, Jews were expelled within 14 years in 1498 and had to leave by 1499. It is therefore even more striking that the 1503 edition of the Nuremberg Legal Code, the second edition, four years after the expulsion of Jews from the city, still explicitly included the jury oath. Did the printer just forget to remove the chapter or was the jury oath still in use? A strong clue that the jury oath was kept deliberately in the 1503 edition is the fact that it was given two alphabetical index entries. So one entry was under oath, Eide der Juden zuletzt in der Reformation, shown here. Um, so, and you see that every other uh, chapter had page numbering um, and, and um, chapter, uh, um, the chapter arrangements and then page numbering. The, the jury oath only has a page numbering. Um, overall, that it was still in the 1503 edition, it means that there was still a need for the jury oath in Nuremberg and that business and other interactions between Christian Jews in Nuremberg continued after the expulsion. However, outside the city, which is also confirmed in other sources. Okay, here it, it is. Um, then in 1522, Nuremberg reprinted the uh, reprint and the subsequently editions no longer contain the jury oath. So here we have either again, but there's not the jury oath has vanished. Conclusion. The 1584 Nuremberg jury oath is first and foremost a cutting edge innovative tool in line with the overall ambitious revision of the municipal legal code of Nuremberg. The jury oath aimed at integrating a minority group into the legal and economic framework of a dominantly Christian society. It combined Christian and Jewish elements so that both groups felt at ease about the valid validity of transactions. On the other hand, the 1484 Nuremberg jury oath is also a symbol of cynical realpolitik. The Nuremberg Municipal Council had secret plans to get rid of its Jews after the Jewish community lost its economic power and usefulness. When the chance arose of buying out the Jewish community from Emperor uh, Maximilian I, the Municipal Council moved quickly. The emperor even took the blame for the expulsion entirely on himself, and the city remained publicly innocent and did not even incur expenses since it was able to sell the Jewish properties it took over to interested Christian citizens. What else is new? This ambiguous relationship between the jury oath as an innovative legal tool which helped to integrate the Jewish minority and the city's plan to get rid of its Jews is also mirrored in the way the 1484 jury oath was incorporated into Nuremberg. A brand new legal code. It's important and symbolic that the jury oath became part of the overall legal code, but it was only an added unnumbered chapter at the end of the book, which could be easily separated and removed. Ultimately, this probably envisioned separation did take place. The jury oath disappeared over time from the legal code of the city of Nuremberg and the Jews were expelled in 1495. However, the reality of the matter was not as black and white. The fact that the first reprint of the Nuremberg Legal Code in 1503, four years after the expulsion, still explicitly featured the jury oath is a clear indication that business relationships between Jews and Christians continued regardless, albeit outside the city. In addition, the innovative 1484 jury oath formula was incorporated into the imperial so-called Reichskammergerichtsordnung around 1538 and found a dedicated space there and was valid until the 19th century. Overall, the history of the 1484 Nuremberg jury oath is an important and ambivalent milestone in the history of Jewish-Christian relations. And this was a short version. A more comprehensive version of this study was just was is published um, and you can find it here or email me for a PDF. Um, so I'm um, just my questions to my um, uh, to the Jewish public 
uh, Library in Montreal. So I will continue now with the second presentation. Is that fine? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So we are also good time wise, no? I hope. In the center, and this one is shorter. Uh, the center of my second example of a Christian Jewish discourse is a book which is titled Augenspiegel, Mirror of the Eyes, and which was published in 1511. This book is famous is the famous defense against the burning of Jewish books. It triggered an international pre-reformation debate, so-called Bücherstreit, or Battle of the Books. It was, it was about the status of Jews, but also about the freedom of scientific research as well as freedom of speech. The debate pitted the traditional teachings of the Catholic Church against the humanist ideals of the Renaissance. Our book, which we see here, is part of an 80 volume collection uh, regarding this case that we re received from a private uh, collector, Franz Herz. Um, I would like to tell you the short version of the story. It starts with the appearance of Johannes Pfefferkorn. Um, here in, in a rendering of an 18th, 18th century rendering, he was a Jew who converted to Christianity in 1505 and acted as an anti-Jewish agitator. Pfefferkorn preached against Jews, attempting to destroy copies of the Talmud and other Jewish texts. His mission was supported from many quarters, including the Franciscan and Dominican orders, as well as the University of Cologne and several German princes. His first propaganda um, piece, pamphlet, the Judenspiegel of 1507 is an example of one of his anti-Jewish pamphlets in a parallel German, so this is that, and a Latin edition. The woodcut on this title page in particular is reminiscent of medieval anti-Semitic legends of the blood libel myth with the destruction of the host up to ritual murders. So we have a crucifixion scene embellished with the baptism basin filled with blood, the presentation of a, a child, and here a circumcision scene, and devils connecting the Jewish Christian references, a visual iconographic language that was certainly understood by a predominantly illiterate, illiterate Christian population. So that was pretty much the TikTok of its time. Pfeffer Korn's is next thing, the Judenbeichte of 1508, so that was one pamphlet after the other, is another example of a title published in German, in a German and a parallel Latin edition. Judenbeichte means the confession of the Jews, and the illustration here is actually modeled after Yom Kippur scene. The German version features the same in image on the second page, right? Since Pfefferkorn did not know Latin, the involvement of the Dominican order in Cologne as the actual mastermind of these propaganda publications is fairly, fairly certain. You can see that a media campaign was waged here using the latest technologies. Letterpress printing was invented by Gutenberg only about 50 years ago. Then we see here the printing of short, inexpensive pamphlets in quick succession combined with illustrations, which was particularly effective since most of the population, the Christian, at least the Christian population, could not read. Pfefferkorn agitations were successful. There were confiscations and burnings of books, of Jewish books, especially Talmud editions took place in several cities. Then the Archbishop of Mainz intervened with the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I, but not because he was concerned about the protection of Jewish texts, but because he was not involved. So this is a very political story. And here's a portrait of the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I. So what could a savvy politician do in this situation when several powerful players, especially the church, have different opinions and the situation may escalate under circumstances on an international scale? So in 1510, Emperor Maximilian decided to convene a commission of experts to review the matter. So it sounds very modern. Participants were eminent theologians from various faculties, for example, Cologne, Mainz, but also the scholar Johannes Reuchlin. Here again, an 18th, 18th century rendering of Johannes Reuchlin. He was from Pforzheim, uh, a German humanist, lawyer and scholar, who was for many years uh, in the service of Duke Ebert of Württemberg. Reuchlin was the first Christian German scholar to master all the languages of the 
Bible, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. And by the way, his Latin dictionary was a bestseller. We have the 22nd edition of 1501 in our collection. Euchlin's confidential, confidential expert opinion of 1510 concluded that Jewish books should not be destroyed. First, for legal reasons. The, book were, the books were the property of Jews who were traditionally directly subordinate to the emperor and thus quasi-imperial property. And then for humanistic reasons. One does not destroy what one does not know. And it was assumed that the writing of the Jews could have scientific value, especially for the study of the Hebrew Bible. However, predictively, the theologian of the various universities came to a different conclusion for precisely that reason. Emperor Maximilian I accepted the opinions. And as a savvy politician, for the time being, did nothing. Probably he hoped that the storm would come down by itself. But the Catholic Church did not accept that. And now one of the most famous leaks of the early modern history happened. As a first step, as a next step, the leak, Pfefferkorn circulated the Handspiegel, wieder und gegen die Juden, at the Frankfurt Fair in 1511, in which he attacked Reuchling's expert opinion. And this leak of a confidential expert opinion was the starting signal for the so-called Bücherstreit, the Battle of the Books. Reuchlin decided at this point to appear publicly as well and defended himself with this public writing of the Augenspiegel. So now we have this also with this striking um, um, title page. The theologians of the University of Cologne then tried to suppress the Augenspiegel. In 1512, together with the Inquisitor Joachim von Hochstraten, they obtained an imperial order to confiscate the Augenspiegel. Okay. Um, it continued. The same year, 1512, Pfefferkorn published his Brandspiegel, an even more vicious attack on Reuchlin and the Jews. It also propagated the expulsion of Jews from Frankfurt, the cities of Rhineland, and forced baptism of children. Reuchlin appealed and filed another defense, the defensio. Um, the manuscript was completed around March 1513 and published in the same year for Easter Mass here in a published version in 1514. The dispute drew wider and wider circles. All leading intellectuals and scholars took up the quarrel. However, it was no longer about the books of the Jews, but the case was mainly directed against Reuchling, who was accused of heresy. The case turned international, so to speak. The French king took a stance, and around 1517 19, the controversy was to be brought before the Pope. The Cologne Inquisitor already traveled to Rome. Um, we really wait here for the Hollywood movie. With the publication of L Luther's thesis in 1517, the Catholic Church was, however, otherwise occupied. And with the death of Maximilian I in 1519 and Reuchlin in 1522, the Reuchlin case came to a halt. But the media controversy went on for decades. Some of the pamphlets were reprinted again and again. For example, Reuchlin's, it's called Epistole Clarorum Virorum, Letters of Famous Bright Man from 1511, a collection of letters from important German humanists who supported him. Or for example, um, so that is that. The other one, the, um, the Epistole Obscurorum Virorum, Letters of Obscure Men, or in German, it's very nice, Dunkel Männerbriefe, the Letters of Dark Men a famous collection of satirical Latin letters. They make fun of the teachings and way of life of the scholastic and monks in the form of letters from fanatical Christian theologians discussing whether or not all Jewish books should be burned as unchristian. However, it was no longer necessarily about defending Jewish books, but rather about criticizing the Catholic Church and thus the book controversy accompanies the disputes between Protestants and Catholics for the next century. And with this, I conclude. <laughs> I think we are good time-wise. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, good, and so I'll turn it over to my colleagues from the Jewish Public Library in Montreal. Thank you. <laughs>